I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Andy Rayner, who's the chief technologist of Nevion, a Sony group company. And Andy's going to be talking about audio in IP production. So take it away, Andy. Thank you, Wes. It's good to be back again. I was there, here almost right at the beginning of the show, and I feel like I'm dragging in the, the last day here. So I hope everyone's still got some, some good energy. Before I dive into any of my technology, I'm just going to do what I, what I did on the, a couple of the previous presentations and just give tribute to the Queen and actually point out there's a picture of me and Queen Elizabeth when I was 10 years old. So if you can see me there. So, um, so res yeah, I had a full, a full head of hair and weighed a lot less. Okay, before I get into the topic proper, I would also like to just point out that actually um, I am an audio man at heart. So, so uh, the, this, this is a, a, a passion of mine, both in my work and outside of my work. And again, just to show this picture, which I show at many, many presentations, it kind of shows the, the distributed production architecture <clears throat> that we're heading to for many of the way we do production now. So more and more, it's not about having a local facility where everything happens. More and more, we're actually doing things in a distributed manner. In this picture, the orange is control surfaces, the dark blue is acquisition devices, and then the light blue is the processing, the storage, etc. But the, the whole concept of distribution is very important. And what that means, just to outline that on one more picture here, is we have our three Ps. Because just going to IP on its own doesn't give massive benefit unless you start thinking about the sharing of resources, the sharing of processing, the sharing of people, and the sharing of locations. So all of those things are, are, are key benefits on top of the you know, format agnostic transport that IP gives us. Just other, one other comment overall about... Um, about IP in, in it's audio in IP productions is it drives real scale. Um, those of you that have been familiar with um, kind of a typical standard production facility that would have been based on an SDI router, maybe you have 1,000, 2,000 square um, you know, cross point routing and the audio is all embedded in there. What we're moving to now, some of the distributed production environments that we're actually controlling and switching now for infrastructure I'm involved in is upwards of 150,000 flows. And that's driven not insignificantly by a massive amount of audio that's there um, as well as video. Because typically, depending on how you, watch, how you want to carry and manipulate the audio, you can have multiple elements of audio or multiple flows of audio for every given video flow that you're carrying. So just want to give kudos to the audio guys, and there's a couple of friends in the audience I see that have been significantly part of this. Um, but just credit, the, the audio guys did this first. So when we talk about the whole IP production environment and 2110 and everything else, you know, uh, a lot of that was learning from, from what the IP audio guys had already done with infrastructure. Um, one or two observations on that as, as we go through. And just to point out, that um, as per the previous slide, that you know, the audio is generally by far the more complex element of a system. There are far more flows. There's actually a lot more things you want to do with audio. And of course, you've not only got program audio, but you've got comms audio as well, which is a very, very significant element of production as well. And typically, you know, you're pulling in audio. One of the key things that we're seeing a lot more doing, just going back to that distributed production concept, is remote audio commentary. That's just one thing that's and that's being done generally geographically distributed. So there's a lot of long hauling of audio as well as pro probably requisite um, proxy video to go with that. So just diving back a little bit of history, because um, this is kind of by way of a little bit of a tutorial as well as some, some of my thoughts on where, where we're heading with audio and, and, and some illustrations of how we do it in, in the real world. I just thought it was worth thinking back to the, the original premise of sampling. So interestingly, I looked up and actually 19, sorry, yeah, 1921 was that when the patent for PCM, pulse code modulation, was actually lodged. So we're just about, just over a hundred years since PCM audio was actually started. And, and, the, and the concept of sampling a signal and, and, the, and the requisite work that Nyquist did on that was in the, well, you see 1903 and Nyquist, I think, 
um, did his sampling theorem in the 1920s. So it's a long time ago. We're now talking about um, you know over 100 years ago since that, since that actually was brought into into being those concepts. And then just for one more bit of amusement, um, these are A to D converters. So the one on the left, 1954. It was a vacuum, chip, vacuum tube analog digital converter with 11-bit resolution. And as you can see there, it was massively heavy, 150 pounds, and consumed 500 watts of power to do an 11-bit A to D conversion. And then I do remember in my, uh, in my university days, which was in mid to late, eight, later 80s, um, being really excited to get hold of a 14-bit audio sampling frequency A to D converter. But this is one of these other ones from a bit earlier on. That's from 1977. Anyway, enough of the kind of history and, and where we've been. Just some practical fundamentals um, that to put in place about what, we, what we're considering as we look at audio formats and, and how we do audio in IP production. The fundamentals. When you, when you grab, when you sample audio, you're, do, you're, doing th you're sampling it at a certain frequency. And I referred to Nyquist just previously. There are, there, are, there's a, there are reasons why we sample at the frequencies we do. And then there's the, the bit depth, the depth at which you're actually creating each of those samples. Those are the two fundamental parameters on the acquisition. But the other really important thing, and actually is becoming even more important as we move to nonlinear production or nonlinear compute-based processing of media data for live production is the time of capture. And we'll, we'll come on to that and look at that just in a few minutes. There are lots and lots of different audio faces and interfaces and formats. And of course, there are also many, many different variants within that. So we've come from a whole plethora of different things there on the left. And then there are some, some standards, you know, very specifically, I'm focusing here on the 2110-30 and 31, which is basically a subset of AS67. And then there's a whole load of, of other audio formats that are in significant use that have some degree of proprietary nature, either in the data plane or in the control plane. So because of that, we effectively have the scenario where in the data plane, the actual media flows, many, many of these audio formats are almost identical, um, but the control plane, the way, the way the control plane works can be actually significantly different. And then just to talk about the mixing up the choices of, of, of the, 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 the number of permutations of how you can do audio, this is just a little example. I've actually included Maddy on there because Maddy has had a bit of a renaissance in the last 15 years. I, I, I thought it had probably kind of died out, uh, but just because it's a very format agnostic, you know, dumb interface that you can actually hand off a bulk audio for remote production where we're actually seeing a massive amount of MADI um, still being used for that bulk audio interfacing. But AES67 is obviously the I, a, a much more IP, flexible IP equivalent. And, and as I said, AES2110-30 um, is a subset of that. And there are many, many formats, many options in, in, by the way you can actually format and parameterize that. And I'll come to some recommendations on that in a minute. So this is the, the whole um, SMPTE 2110 toolkit, or not quite the whole one now, because there's more stuff that um, I haven't featured on here. The top two, the hot top two rows represent the, 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 what I call the data plane, the media flows themselves. And the bottom, bottom row is all about the control plane, how we actually switch control and access those flows. And you'll see there we have the dash 30 and the dash 31. And again, just as a, as a mini reminder, the difference between dash 30 and 31 is dash 30 actually carries all 24 bits of the traditional PCM sample. So the idea is dash 30 is a PCM audio transport. Dash 31 carries all of the other bits that we, we know and love from the, from the AS3 signal, um, which are not necessarily used, but some devices and some, some proprietary implementations use some elements of those to actually carry additional signaling information. Um, so so there, there is a need sometimes to carry all 32 bits of the, the AS3 signal, as well as the actual traditional PCM samples. We then come to, do, to thinking about timing and referencing. So the, we talked about the concept of sampling. Um, you need to determine that, but you also want to determine 
um, the, the absolute time at which you're actually sampling that. And that's incredibly important when you're actually running in an essence-based environment. One of the fundamentals of SD2110 is the concept that we actually have different flows, uh, different paths through the production environment for the audio signals as we do for the video signals and requisite metadata and other flows that would be associated. But to actually allow us to actually reconcile them, that, that it's, it's important that we actually have um, not just relative frequency lock, but we have the potential for absolute timing. And one of the premises of um, how, how we actually do both acquisition for video and audio is there is a, a, a PTP reference, which I just showed you on that previous slide, from the, from a, typically from a GNSS reference, um, which we actually use to actually timestamp um, all of the sampling points, and that happens in the audio. So in the audio, where you know we actually we tick our RTP timestamp clock at the sample rate frequency. So typically that's 48 kilohertz. We tick that clock slightly differently, but similarly in concept, a slight derivation, arguably from the the intended use of RTP. We actually freeze the RTP timestamp and actually have a common RTP timestamp for that sampling moment in time of the video. So, so just going back to that, so the audio, you know, each, each sample we tick the clock. In video, we actually freeze the timestamp in the RTP for the duration of all of the samples that represent that moment in time capture of the video. Possibly, we may have done it a different way if we'd have thought about that previously. So the standardized control plane, there are many, many, or there are several very, very well-deployed proprietary audio solutions that have garnered a lot of success and, and run very effectively. But what we've been looking to do um, within the 2110 environment is actually create some standard tools that allow us to specifically connect, disconnect, and discover, um, and, and shuffle the, the audio elements um, in, in audio flows um, in, in, a, in an open manner that actually allows us to do that across, across the whole industry. Um, the, the control plane arguably took a little bit longer to get established, um, but the NMOS tools are in, in wide use. And if any of you want to look at the JTNM tested catalog, which was published only earlier this week from the testing that happened in Germany, um, in Wuppertal in, um, in August, then just last month, then that will actually demonstrate, if you want to go through the minutiae of the detail of the report, you can see from the catalog how many devices are actually supporting both the audio plane, the, both the data plane for the audio flows, but also uh, the control plane as well. How do we actually describe what's happening, what's available in the stream? So what, what happens in 2110, we have the SDP, which is actually a, a, a set of information which is a relatively static way of, of, hand, of describing what's happening about a flow. Um, so there is some work which is relatively slow burning, I have to say, within the standards organization for the for Dash 41 and 42 parts of the SMPTE 2110 portfolio, which are actually seeking to allow a faster update of critical metadata in flight within a program. So for instance, if an audio stream was going to change um, some parameters uh, in flight, then, then that would be a, a, a faster way of updating. And that's, that's frame accurate because the SDP typically is something that only has a refresh that's maybe uh, the order of seconds. You, you wouldn't be kind of updating that on a sub-second basis as usual. So thinking about the way we do audio, one, one thing that we've seen a massive amount of requirement for is not surprisingly, all the stuff we've been used to doing in audio in production, um, changing the gain, doing compensating delay, shuffling channels, doing down mix work, et cetera. Um, but what we need to do now is to do that in the IP domain. And this is another flexibility of the of the concept of having all our signals routed and manipulated in, in, the, in the IP domain. So we actually can just, rather than having to plug AES3 signals through or even analog flows and then you know, adjust manual things here, we can actually have these as a service. So a lot of the deployments that I've been involved in, we have a whole bank of audio processing which we can route in and out of to do different functions. I'm just going to underlie in a minute the kind of other functions and the way the way that behaves. But this is the kind of thing um, 
that we need to do all the time. And in the IP domain, it's very, very easy to actually do this. So how to shuffle in a modern world. So there's various schools of thought about how you should do audio in an IP production. Um, as I said, the, you, know, you can dimension even in excess of 64 channels in a single IP flow if you want to. Um, and when you're actually long hauling from a remote production, then actually aggregating a, a many flows in a single, in a, in a single stream is actually, um, is actually generally a good idea. Um, but within, within, within a studio, um, we, we discover there are actually many different devices that typically support specific channel widths, if you like, within a flow. Some, some things will be mono, some things will be stereo, some things will be eight channel, et cetera, and some things can take you know, up to a full typical 64 channel um, handoff. So, so we actually have a big need um, to actually be able to manipulate audio between these different environments. One other comment um, about phase coherency, the, the, the whole standards of, of AS67 and, and the requisite or following on um, 21, 10, 30 and 31, um, you know, everything, the way it's defined is sample accurate. So there is, there is no problem with actually carrying the same elements of the, of the same audio um, environment in different IP flows. However, I think typically from a, from a conceptual perspective, most people like to at least maintain phase coherent audio images in, in, in one flow. So as in, if I've got a stereo image, I would typically route that as a stereo flow rather than as two monos. And if I've got a surround sound mix, I would typically route that um, as a single flow rather than individual flows. But there is no reason why you can't do that to mono, apart from obviously you are impacting the scaling of your routing because if, if you're actually breaking each of your 16 audio channels that you've got associated with your video to an individual flow, then you've got 16 times the number of flows that you're actually needing to, to route, which may not seem too much of an issue, but when you've got you know, many thousand video connections, you're actually then talking about you know, many, many, many more audio flows. So a, a, few, a few practical options. This is typically you know, some variants that you, you would see, as well as obviously that bulk handoff, which actually has, has, has many more than this. So most organizations we're seeing are templating maybe like half a dozen different audio options that they're gonna be routing within their environment to actually be able to service the different devices that are needed um, as part of that. And we've seen, you know, we've actually developed a couple of different tools which we, we look at really to kind of service the way that works. One is, is manipulating or like what I call embedded audio, be that embedded in a traditional SDI or in the IP equivalent of 2022-6, or um, taking audio only environments that don't necessarily need to be video reference, which can be any bus width of asynchronous audio you're pulling in. It can be MADI, which typically is likely to be asynchronous and you're gonna need to bring that in or um, local, local digital or analog points that you want to do. But manipulating this is an incredibly important part of, of, the, of the production environment. So moving outside the campus, so WAN connectivity involved, and it's fair to say, I think most audio production, you know, most earlier audio production environments typically were, were, were campus-based, were campus-based, um, were even subnet-based, so working in a, in a, effectively in a, in a layer two environment. Um, but once you start, once you start expanding, and you're actually doing the distributed production I talked about earlier, then you actually need more flexibility in, in the way audio works, and, and you know that can be done. And the, one of the solutions that happens a lot is is effectively tie lines between um, layer two audio environments in different connect. These may be in geographical locations, or it may be in, in different zones within, uh, within a production environment. So one of the things that AES 67 really thought about, which we, we stumbled upon, I would say a little bit in, 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 some, of the, in some of the way we actually looked at this as we, as we approached the, tw the 2110 toolkit was, was defining a link offset. And this is, this is kind of saying when this is a, a numerical value which represents the, the, the actual transit time, but also the, the front and back end of the interfacing 
of the audio signal to actually create a deterministic time when you actually want to present that. Um, I want to just reference that with respect to some work that um, many of us are involved in at the moment, which is hopefully going to be a, another part of the SIMPTI toolkit, um, hopefully the 2110-11 um, at some point in the next few months. And this is actually how do we reconcile time of the different media essence flows. So one of the things which AES67 doesn't do, um, which is unfortunate, but arguably is more in line with RTP transport timestamp thinking, um, is, is that it, each, each time you em emit egress a, an audio device, it creates a new RTP timestamp. Now, there is the potential within um, the specification, especially encouraged in some of the modifications that are going through the, the big symptom mill at the moment, um, to actually incur, in, 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 encourage timestamp preservation. If you think back to what I said at the beginning about the origination time, actually grabbing the absolute time at which that audio or video is sampled, then the, theoretically it is possible throughout a production to actually maintain the association of that capture timestamp with the audio samples or with the video frame that it's associated with. And more and more devices are starting to do that, but because we've derived from AS67 and it doesn't do that, I think we're, we're never gonna get that, that kind of behavior from audio devices. So the kind of concept that we're actually working on at the moment within the, the activity group is to look at what I call a, a, high, a hybrid timing reconciliation. So basically, you're, you're aware that potentially some elements of the chain in, for some media flows may actually preserve some timing information, but fundamentally, what we need to do, because we need to be able to reconcile, if you think about that red line on the right-hand side, um, the, for instance here, a video time with its associated audio time. So to do that, we have to do the math, the accumulated math of the transit of all of the, but the processing time and the link times of the audio flow and do the same with the video flow. And we're trying to develop um, the, the, the system recommendations, if you like, to allow us to actually prov automatically for a control system to actually compute those offsets in all of the different media flows and actually allow it to reconcile. Just a few other, few other quick points. I've got another three minutes, I think. First of all, PTP, many, many audio devices, um, well, obviously any system that's based on 2110 relies on having a timing reference, be that video or audio, that's an intrinsic part of the way it works. Um, but it's, it's one, one thing that I think we've started to do within the vendor community is what I do is what I call graceful degradation. Um, it's very easy for devices, if they, lo inst if they lose a, a PTP reference, to actually instantly shut down, but actually hold off is 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 very is a very capable thing, and and it's it's very straightforward for devices to gracefully behave when they lose timing reference rather than just muting. It's worth saying that the audio world hasn't traditionally had as much of the concept of of diversity and protection routing as as we have intrinsically brought up as we've introduced in with with video so top left the spatial diversity is is what we call 2022-7 which we can apply equally well to audio flows or any other real time rtp flow as we can to um, as we can to video flows we also other, have other techniques both spatial both temporal diversity, but also applying, if you're going outside of campus, applying protection like FEC to a flow to allow us to do that. And of course there is, in addition to this, ARQ, which is requesting packet resends, which is part of the work that RIST have been looking at, and you can actually find out more about that on some of the other tutorials if you like. This, yeah, I've just been told I don't have to hurry. I'm, I'm getting near the end though, don't worry. Um, the this is a, an example of an international use case for audio flows in an essence-based format. So what we're doing here is we're actually routing internationally as well as locally all of the requisite audio flows. We have many, many AES30, sorry, AES30, 2110-30 flows um, flowing through an, the international connectivity in the same manner that we've got the video connectivity. One of the, one of the things we've been looking at in, in what the 
wide area connectivity group, which I'll reference in a minute, is actually how, again, how we actually understand the relative timing offset between video and audio when we're transiting there. Security is a key element, and I think it's very important to say, you know, I, arguably this slide should go at the front of the presentation and the back of the presentation, because there are, there are many scenarios we've seen where arguably the industry hasn't put security as the absolute most important thing, and that is incredibly vital. We're not gonna unpack security now, but I wanted to shout it out. So as we go off campus, there's a whole lot of different things happening. So we're thinking about audio within a facility, but there's actually many things that happen, as you can see outlined here, when we go off facility. Um, some of these may, we may want to do, I mean, we probably wouldn't want necessarily to, to compress audio, whereas we may well want to compress video. But I want to highlight the work that's just finished um, on the 2110 over one activity group, which actually has looked at both the, the data flow, the, the media flows themselves, and slightly more complexly, it's turned out, the, the data plane, the actual how we actually discover and control those flows across a wide area network. And effectively, to sum it up in just a quick, a cup, a quick couple of slides, we have the data plane at the bottom, you can see there, where we've got potentially some of that error protection and other encoding we may want to do for wide area transit. And then we've We've developed a toolkit which is a subset of the NMOS tools that we are, many of us are using within facilities to actually advertise and allow us to actually do um, a secure way of handing off between facilities to allow each facility, because these could be competitive facilities we're handing off between, handing each, allowing each facility to actually maintain this, the security of its borders yet get as much of a plug and play environment as possible. And just to show you what the control plane looks like expanding it, I'm not gonna unpack this now. There are several other tutorials we've done when we've looked at this, but basically we actually effectively proxy those flows at the boundaries. And it's also worth saying when we go between facilities that, that we need to do other things like pro typically address translating the media flows. So in the control plane, all of that requisite and relevant control plates control plane data that relates to those flows, including the SDPs, needs to be natted as well to make it relevant in the other facility so it appears as a flow that you would that you can understand and use. As I draw to a close, I just want to talk about a couple of um, things where I see us heading in the future. So what we've talked about so far with, with, with all of this audio and, and with the video and which has been the same for the last 90 years. And there's a, I did a more in-depth tutorial on this on Friday, which you can check out online if you like. But the, um, this is my vision of where we're heading for a future. So as I alluded to at the beginning, when we were talking about sampling, acquisition is always a real-time process, be that the video or the audio. You're, you're acquiring the real world, either the audio or the video in real time. The consumption is always going to be a real-time function for however it's reconstituted for the end, end viewer, whether that's on a phone, a tablet, or some other device, or, or a traditional television. Um, and obviously, the human beings, those in the gallery, those in the sound booth, etc., cetera, uh, need to actually be listening to and watching those media as real-time flows. However, as we move to a more... more all compute environment moving forward. There is no reason why, in fact, compute doesn't do linear flows very well. Compute is inherently a bursty process. It goes off, does some math, pushes it back. So you, compute is inherently bursty. And we spent a lot of energy as an industry uh, as we've gone to compute for some functions, actually forcing compute to give us nice linear flows of both audio and video to actually be compliant to the standards that we've got. Whereas actually, as long as we take the timestamps, and this becomes even more important on, in a non-linear world, as long as we take those timestamps of the acquisition and actually make sure they are carried with the samples, be they the video samples or the audio samples or any, anything else that's relevant real-time data, as long as we do that, we, we can actually have a time-aware but non-real-time, brackets, it has to obviously be at least as fast as real-time, but it doesn't need to be real-time processing engine, as long as we're able to reconstitute those elements at the right point. So th there are some changes, I believe, ahead of us in terms of the way we hand data off. There's various work happening in various groups thinking about how we do this. And um, 
this, the RTP UDP that we talked about there with the protection, you know, the, the reason we're being so fussy about that is because an RTP flow, because it's UDP based, is inherently uh, you know, a fire and forget. It's a non-handshaking technology unless you add ALQ on the back. So there are other technologies, some of them very standard and we're very used to, some more proprietary to specific cloud vendors on the right hand side there, where the, that are actually being used to actually provide guaranteed data integrity a transfer. But what we're going to be coming more and more aware of is that data transfer is not necessarily going to be, want to be linear UDP because we actually are in our environment, if we're in, in a compute environment, it's going to be more bursty and we, we actually cannot rely on just UDP to actually give us the integrity we need. So we're probably going to be thinking about other techniques for actually transferring. And audio arguably is a little bit easier in some elements. There are several technologies that probably can do that with audio bit rates that we're more challenged to do with, with um, video flows because of the sheer size. So in conclusion, we've whistled through some of the theories of how, how we've done sampling, how we've got to where we are today, a little look to the future, as well as look at how we've actually done some practical manipulation of audio in IP facilities um, today. So hopefully that's been of some elements of that have been so, of some value to some of you. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here, watching the presentation. If you want to come over to the Sony stand in Hall 13, I'd love to make you a cup of tea. And if you're ever coming to the UK, I'd love to offer you a cup of tea. Give us a shout, call me on my cell or my email, and um, let's have a cup of tea. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, Andy.